By the end of this one hour business English masterclass, you are going to sound more fluent, sound more professional and feel more confident. Welcome back to J4S English. Of course, I'm Jennifer. Now let's get started. First in this masterclass, you are going to learn 14 phrases that you can use at work in any situation. Number one, feel free to ask me anything. Now notice you're learning a complete phrase. So pay attention to all the words, the prepositions, the articles, the sentence structure matters. So notice here we have feel free plus infinitive. The infinitive is of course to plus the base verb. Feel free to ask me anything. This is used as a polite open-ended invitation. I'm inviting you to ask me whatever you'd like. Remember, you can change that verb. I could say, feel free to send me the report when it's ready. This sounds polite and professional. And remember, it's an open invitation. You're not required to do this. It's an option. If you say, send me the report when it's done, this is the imperative and it's direct and also authoritative. So to sound polite and professional and to give you an open invitation, I can say, feel free to download the free lesson PDF. You can find the link in the description. And this is a real example because I summarize everything from this lesson in the free lesson PDF feel free to download it. Number two, I look forward to hearing your thoughts. So your colleague could say to you, feel free to send me the report when it's done. And then when it's done, you can send it to your colleague and say, here you go. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Notice our sentence structure, look forward to plus gerund, your verb in ing. I look forward to hearing. Don't make this mistake. Make sure you have the gerund. And this is a polite way to show your interest. So in this case, your interest in hearing the person's thoughts, their ideas, their opinions, their feedback. You could say, I look forward to meeting our verb in ing. I look forward to meeting you tomorrow. Now with this structure, you can also use a noun. I look forward to our meeting. That's the noun form. I look forward to our meeting tomorrow. What about you? Are you looking forward to my next lesson? If you are put yes, yes, yes to show your interest, show your enthusiasm, put yes, yes, yes in the comments. Number three, here's my take on it. One's take on something is one's opinion on something. So my take on it is simply my opinion on it. For example, I just read the consultant's recommendations. Here's my take on them. Them because recommendations is plural. Now, when I want to share my opinion, my take, I can simply use an opinion word. I think she raised some valid points. Now I can use this as a question. What's your take on the report, on the recommendations? Number four, from my perspective. Now this is the same as in my opinion, but notice that preposition difference from my perspective, in my opinion. So I see a lot of mistakes when students try to use this. If someone asks you your opinion, what's your take on it? You can use this to start. From my perspective, I think the consultant's recommendations aren't practical. So here you can add on, I think, an opinion word, even though you use from my perspective, but it's optional. And after you share your opinion, you can invite the other person to provide their opinion. What about you? What's your perspective? Number five, can you help me understand? This is a polite way to ask for clarification or an explanation. Your colleague could say, from my perspective, the consultant's recommendations aren't practical. You could comment on this and say, I see, interesting, oh really? And then you can add on this expression. Can you help me understand your perspective, your opinion. 
Can you help me understand? This is a great expression if you want an explanation without sounding very direct or authoritative or angry. If someone says, I don't think we can meet the deadline, you can say, can you help me understand why? Number six, I'll get back to you with that information. This is a great one because someone might ask you a question or to provide information and you don't have that information. You don't know the answer. Instead of saying, I don't know, you can say, I'll get back to you with that information. You can provide a time reference if you'd like. I'll get back to you by the end of the day. So you just gave yourself a deadline. You could say, I'll get back to you in an hour or I'll get back to you ASAP. What does ASAP mean? This is a very common acronym. Put it in the comments. ASAP, what's the acronym? Put it in the comments. Number seven, can you fill me in? This is a great one. It's a casual way to ask for an update or a summary. You could say to your colleague, I was on another call this morning. Can you fill me in on the staff meeting? Notice here, when I specify the something, the staff meeting, you have to use the additional preposition on. Can you fill me in on the staff meeting? This is often used by one person to request another person provide information to someone else. For example, your boss could say to you, hey Danica, can you fill Raphael in? And then if you want to specify the something, you need that preposition on, on the new filing system. Number eight, which one would you like me to prioritize? You can use this to clarify which task should be done first, which one you should prioritize when there are multiple tasks. So you can use this with two tasks or more than two as well. So if you have multiple tasks, you can go to your boss and say, Sarah asked for help on the report and I have to finish the presentation. Which one would you like me to prioritize? So now instead of feeling overwhelmed, you know exactly which task to focus on to prioritize. You can use this even just to get advice from someone you trust. I could say to you, from your perspective, which one should I prioritize? So you're not my boss, you're not responsible for assigning me tasks, but I trust you to provide me with valuable feedback. Which one should I prioritize from your perspective? Number nine, I trust you have everything you need. The word trust is used a lot in a business context. This is used to express overall confidence in someone and their abilities. So you might come to me and say, Jennifer, I feel a little nervous. This is my first time giving a presentation. And I can let you know that I have confidence in you and your abilities. And I can say, I trust you. Or I can add on to this and I can say, I trust you can handle this. So the statement is, you can handle this. Handle means you have the ability to do it. You can handle this. Now, if I add, I trust, it's adding certainty. I'm certain. I know. I trust you can handle this. Number 10, what can we learn from this? Such a powerful question. You can use this to encourage reflection and analysis after a situation, generally a negative situation. So if something negative happened, I didn't get the promotion. You can say, what can I learn from this? Or I failed my IELTS. What can I learn from this? So instead of being upset, angry, mad, now you're thinking about solutions. You're thinking about what you can do differently. This is a great expression to use when you're working with a team. So again, maybe something bad happened. We lost the client. What can we learn from this? And then you can start brainstorming things you can do differently so it doesn't happen again. Now to change the sentence structure, you could also say, what can this teach us? 
So notice, you can learn something from someone or something, a situation, but also something, the situation, can teach you something. Number 11, I'm happy to address that. So notice the sentence structure. We have our verb to be, I am happy, our adjective. So you need to conjugate the verb to be. And then you have the infinitive. I'm happy to address that. And this is used to show a willingness to do something. So when your boss asks you to fill Raphael in, you can say, I'm happy to fill Raphael in. And then remember, if you specify the something, you need that extra pep preposition on the sales process. So you're showing your willingness to do this. This is also a great way to end a presentation or end communication. We're happy to answer any questions you have. So remember that structure, to be happy plus infinitive. Number 12, how can I support you? This is used to offer support, encouragement, assistance, but also to ask how that can be done. Your coworker could be upset and say, I'm so overwhelmed with this project. So you want to show your support. You can say, how can I support you? You can add on how can I best support you as an intensifier. And then you can even add on your willingness and say, I'm happy to help you in any way I can. You can use this to offer assistance to someone as well. If you know your coworker is very busy, you could say, you have a lot on your plate with this presentation, which means you're very busy. How can I support you? Number 13, I value your input. This is to acknowledge the importance of someone's opinion or ideas. So let's use this right now. How can I make my lessons better? How can I make this lesson better? Or how can I make my lessons overall better? Please share your thoughts in the comments. I value your input. And this isn't just an example, it's 100% true. I really value your input. I truly value your input. So please, if there's anything I can do to improve these lessons for you, I want you to love these lessons. So please put your comments below because I truly value your input. Number 14, I appreciate your hard work on this. Everyone loves to be appreciated, so you can use this to show gratitude, appreciation for someone's work. You can start by complimenting someone. The report looks fantastic. And then add on, I appreciate your hard work on this. Adding that on will make that person feel really valued. Or maybe your friend is planning a party for you and you can say, the menu looks amazing. I appreciate all your hard work on this. You can add all your hard work to intensify it. Now in the workplace, you need to understand fast English. And the best way to do that is by practicing listening to fast English. And that's what we'll do right now. Here's how this lesson will work. I'm going to say a sentence three times and you need to write down exactly what you hear in the comments. Are you ready for your first listening test? I'll say it three times. It was a cakewalk. It was a cakewalk. It was a cakewalk. Did you get this one? I said it was a cakewalk. Let's talk about was a. You can combine these together and it sounds like was a. Za. So notice I'm linking the sounds and I'm taking that was but it's a z, z, it's a voiced sound. So I'm going to transfer that sound to ah. So you hear za, za, was a, was a. It was a cakewalk. It was a cakewalk. This thing was a cakewalk, right? What does this mean to be a cakewalk? This means that something is simple or effortless. You might be familiar with the idiom to be a piece of cake. 
When you describe something as a piece of cake, it means simple or effortless. This is the same idiom, it's just slightly changing it to be a cakewalk. Piece of cake. Hopefully, you would say learning English becomes a cakewalk when you have a great teacher. If you agree, then put cakewalk, cakewalk, put cakewalk in the comments. Remember that you have to conjugate your verb to be with the subject and the time reference. This was a cakewalk in the past simple. This is a cakewalk in the present simple. This will be a cakewalk in which verb tense? the future simple, and this has been a cakewalk. Which verb tense? The present perfect. And also remember the article. It's always a cakewalk. This was a cakewalk. Are you enjoying this lesson? If you are, then I want to tell you about the Finally Fluent Academy. This is my premium training program where we study native English speakers from TV, the movies, YouTube, and the news so you can improve your listening skills of fast English, expand your vocabulary with natural expressions, and learn advanced grammar easily. Plus, you'll have me as your personal coach. You can look in the description for the link to learn more, or you can go to my website and click on Finally Fluent Academy. Now let's continue with our lesson. Let's try this again a little more advanced. I'll say it three times. It's a band-aid fix. It's a band-aid fix. It's a band-aid fix. Did you hear this one? I said it's a band-aid fix. Of course, it's is our contraction of it is, it's, it's, band aid is two words but to pronounce them like one i'll take that d and transfer it to the vowel band-aid dade band-aid 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 fix a band-aid fix is a temporary solution to a problem to understand this expression you need to know what a band-aid is this is a band-aid this is the brand name for bandage but the brand name is Band-Aid and native speakers just refer to bandages as Band-Aids. I put Band-Aids on it, but... Remember, this means a temporary solution to a problem. You could say, filling the potholes is a Band-Aid fix. This entire road needs to be repaved. But it's just a Band-Aid fix. Now, there are many temporary solutions to help you improve your English, but not all of them are permanent. For example, relying on ChatGPT to write for you is a Band-Aid fix. Remember the article, our noun is a fix, and then Band-Aid is an adjective, a Band-Aid fix. And although a Band-Aid fix means a temporary solution, you can't say a Band-Aid solution. You must always say a Band-Aid fix because that's the word choice in this expression. Let's try this again, a little more difficult. I'll say it three times. You can't rest on your laurels. You can't rest on your laurels. You can't rest on your laurels. Did you get this one? I said, you can't rest on your laurels. Native speakers often pronounce T as a flap T, which means we don't push out that puff of air because it forces us to take a pause. You can't. So I don't say you can't. I say you can't. You can't rest on. So here you hear that T because I'm linking the two words together and I'm transferring the T sound onto the vowel. Rest on, ton, rest on, rest on. Your is pronounced in spoken English as an unstressed your, your. You can't rest on your, your laurels. This could be a hard word to pronounce depending on your native language because we have an R and an L. Lore, ols, lore, ols. So divide the sounds until you're comfortable with each sound, lore, ols, and then you can pronounce it as one, laurels, laurels. The expression is to rest on your laurels. We use this to say that you shouldn't become too 
comfortable or stagnant with past achievements, past successes, you should set new goals. You should push yourself further. You shouldn't rest on your laurels. For example, the author wrote an international bestseller, but then rested on her laurels. So she had a past accomplishment, past success with this international bestseller that she wrote, but because she rested on her laurels, it means that she didn't set new goals. She didn't push herself further. So she didn't write anything after that international bestseller. She just remained successful based on her past success, but didn't achieve any new success. Let's think about this in a language learning context. Maybe you have a past success with a high score on an exam. It's amazing that you got a band nine on your IELTS last year, but you can't just rest on your laurels. So this sounds like after your amazing accomplishment, your band nine, you stopped trying to improve. You stopped trying to improve even more. You just rested on your laurels. You had that past success and you thought you were done with language learning, which of course isn't the case. So to help motivate this friend who's resting on their laurels, you can say subscribe to j Forest English and keep improving, keep learning, keep growing. Don't rest on your laurels. Let's try this one more time, the most advanced listening exercise. I'll say it three times. I'm going out for a bit. I'm going out for a bit. I'm going out for a bit. Did you get this one? I said, I'm going out for a bit. Of course, I'm is our contraction of I am, I'm, I'm. I'm going out. Again, we have that flap T because I'm not going to say out. I'm going out. I'm going out. Now, many native speakers will combine all three of these together and they'll pronounce for as more of an unstressed fur. Fur a, fur a bit, fur a bit. And again, that flat T on bit, because I'm not saying bit, for a bit, for a bit. You can still link them together even if you say for, or a native speaker commonly says for, for a bit, for a bit. Now, sometimes native speakers will pronounce the T in this case because it's at the end of a sentence, there's a period. So we have to take a pause anyway, for a bit, for a bit. I'm going out for a bit. To go out, this means to temporarily leave your current location, most commonly your home. For a bit is a time reference and it means for a small amount of time. Sorry guys, I have to go out for a bit. This is a common way that someone will say they're leaving. I'm going out for a bit. Now, where are they going? Well, remember it's more of a, they're going out temporarily. So perhaps they're going to run errands, go grocery shopping, meet a friend, or go to the movies, any small amount of time. We also commonly use this as a suggestion to say, let's leave the house and do something more interesting. We've been watching Netflix all day. Let's go out. Let's go out for a bit. Let's go out tonight. Now let's do an imitation exercise so you can practice these pronunciation changes and practice fast English. So I'll say each sentence again three times. And after each sentence, I want you to repeat the sentence out loud. Here we go. It was a cakewalk. It was a cakewalk. It was a cakewalk. It's a band-aid fix. It's a band-aid fix. It's a band-aid fix. You can't rest on your laurels. You can't rest on your laurels. You can't rest on your laurels. I'm going out for a bit. I'm going out for a bit. I'm going out for a bit. Amazing job with this masterclass. Now at work, you need to talk about permission, obligations, and possibility. And the grammar you need to do that fluently and confidently is modal verbs. 
you are going to learn everything you need to know about modal verbs and I'm going to quiz you at the end. First, let's talk about modal verbs of ability. Can, you know this one already, she can speak four languages fluently or I can see the stars tonight. Notice for the structure, we have our subject, then we have the modal verb, and what comes next? The base verb, I can see. The base verb, I can see the stars tonight. You can't say, ah, can't, you can't say, I can to see the stars tonight. Using the infinitive is grammatically incorrect. So remember that structure, subject, modal, base verb. Don't worry about taking notes because I summarize everything in a free lesson PDF. You can find the link in the description. You can use could for past ability. When I was younger, I could run fast. Now, because you use could, which is past ability, this means that today I can't run fast or I can't run as fast as I could in the past. Notice I use the negative and a contraction. Today I can't run as fast. So the structure here is subject, modal, not, often formed as a contraction, so pay attention to those contractions, and then the base verb, I can't run as fast today. Also remember that modals are not conjugated. They're not conjugated with the subject or the time reference, so grammatically they're very easy. So don't say she can runs, you don't conjugate run with the subject she. You don't conjugate it at all. Of course, without the modal in the present simple, she runs very fast, you would conjugate it, but with the modal, she can run very fast. Let's combine these two together. When I was younger, I couldn't speak English, but now I can. I'm sure that describes you, so put yes I can, yes I can, yes I can, put that in the comments. Keep in mind that could is also the polite form of can. Could you open the window please? Notice the sentence structure for questions. We have the modal, could, then the subject, could you, and then the base verb. Could you open the window please? You can of course use can, can you please open the window? Could sounds more formal, more polite. Notice the placement of please, it can come at the end of the sentence or after the subject. Now let's talk about permission, both asking for permission and giving permission. You can use can, can I leave early today? And then to answer you can say yes you can or no, you can't. I can give you permission and say you can borrow my book. In this case, may is the polite form of can. May I use your phone sounds more formal and polite than can I use your phone. Or to give permission, you may enter now. What about this question? May you open the window please? What do you think about this question? This isn't natural. A native speaker would use could. Could you open the window, please? This is because may is not used with the subject you to ask for permission. With the subject you to ask for permission, use could instead. The other subjects you can use may. May I open the window? May she open the window? May we, may they open the window? But only for you, could you open the window? Don't forget that. Let's talk about possibility, but not certainty. Might, it might rain today. Could, it could rain today. Keep in mind, there is no agreement to what percentage of certainty that might and could represent. So it might rain. What is that? Is that 40% chance of rain, 60%, 80%? There is no general agreement. It depends on 
how the speaker interprets it. So you would just have to ask the person, well, how likely is it? Should I bring an umbrella? And the same goes for could. I'm sure you've noticed by now that one modal can have different meanings. So don't get confused by this. I could run. I could run fast when I was young. This is used for ability. Could you open the window, please? This is the polite form of can. It could rain later. This is for possibility. So you have to look to the context to understand how the modal is being used. Let's talk about obligation, must. This sounds forceful or legally required. You must wear a seatbelt. This is either a very forceful, strong recommendation from someone like your mother, or it is legally required. You must renew your passport. This is something a flight attendant might tell you and they do not allow you to fly because your passport is expired. And this is an obligation. Native speakers commonly use have to when we want to sound less forceful. I have to finish this by tomorrow. We have to start eating healthy. Notice the structure here. We have have to plus base verb. If you prefer, you can think of it as have plus infinitive, which is to plus base verb. Either way, don't forget the to. For lack of obligation, take have to and turn it into the negative. Don't have to. You don't have to complete this form. You do not have to, and then as a contraction, you don't have to complete this form. Or your boss could say to you, you don't have to finish the report. There's a lack of obligation. For the structure here, notice do not, don't, have to, and then base verb. Let's talk about prohibition, things that are prohibited, not allowed, often legally. You can use cannot, and as the contraction, most commonly used, can't. You can't smoke inside, that's prohibited. You must go outside, that's the obligation. You can't smoke inside, you must go outside. You can't use your phone during the exam, that's the prohibition. You must turn off your phone during the exam, that's the obligation. Cannot, as one word, is the correct spelling. The incorrect spelling is can not as two words. So cannot, one word, or the contraction can't. Let's talk about must not because this is a strong recommendation, but it is not a legal requirement. You mustn't sign the contract. This sounds more like my recommendation because I think it's a bad idea. You mustn't sign the contract. You must not sign the contract, but that isn't an obligation. If it were, I would say you can't sign the contract. You're prohibited from signing the contract. Let's talk about advice. You can use should to give and ask for advice or suggestions. You should study five days per week. You should eat more vegetables. You shouldn't quit your English class. You should not, you shouldn't. Ought to is used to give advice or suggestions. You ought to eat more vegetables, but ought to is not used in modern English. I remember my grandma using ought to, but I never do. If you do use it, just remember it's ought to plus base verb. You need that too. To ask for advice or suggestions, use should. Should we partner with this company? Should I stop following J Forest English? What do you think? Well, to reply, you can say, yes, you should, or no, you definitely shouldn't. Hopefully you choose that option. Let's talk about shall. 
So you're at a restaurant, you just finished your meal, you paid for the check, and you can say to the table, shall we go? Shall we go? And then someone at the table could reply back and say, we shall. That is the only modern usage of shall, but it is very commonly used to suggest leaving a place. Shall we go? Shall we go? So if you want to use shall, I only recommend you use it in that specific context. Let's talk about will and would because they are modal auxiliary verbs, so they have many different meanings and uses. Will can be used for spontaneous future decisions. I will help you move. And I just decided in the moment. It wasn't something I planned. I'll help you move. It can be used for predictions, often with I think. I think it will rain tomorrow. It might rain. It could rain tomorrow. We also use will for promises and commitments. I'll subscribe and I'll like this video. If you say that and you use will, you just made a commitment. So make sure you subscribe and like this video so you don't break your promise. Let's talk about would. It's used in hypothetical situations. I would go on vacation if I had more time. So just by saying I would go on vacation, I know it's a hypothetical. We use would for polite requests or offers. Would you like me to make more lessons just like this? You can say, yes, I would, or no, I wouldn't. We also use would for past habitual actions. Remember, could was for past ability, but would is for a habitual action, something you repeatedly did in the past. When I was young, I would spend hours playing in the park. I loved it because I could run really fast. So could is the past ability, but would is the habitual past action. Here's how native speakers have fun with the meaning of modal verbs. Let's say you ask me for something and you say, Jennifer, could you help me? A native could reply back and say, I could, and maybe I should, but I won't. So the questioner is using could as the polite form of can. Could you help me? But I reply, a native speaker replies as a joke, I could, because we're using it for possibility. I could help you. And maybe I should help you because it's an advice or recommendation, but I won't, which is a refusal. So now you know everything you need to know about modals. Let's quiz your knowledge. Here are the questions. Hit pause and take as much time as you need. And when you're ready, hit play to see the answers. Here are the answers. Hit pause, review the answers, and when you're ready, hit play. There are many confusing word pairs in English, and you are going to master the most common. Let's review these word pairs as a little quiz. She was after her long trip. She was weary after her long trip. Did you get that right? Let's review this confusing word pair. We have weary. Listen to that pronunciation, eerie, like ear, weary, weary. This means very tired or lacking energy and enthusiasm. And this could be why after the long journey, she felt completely weary and needed to rest. Or he grew weary of the constant complaints from his colleagues. So he grew tired of them. They made him lack energy and enthusiasm. He grew weary. 
Now, hopefully you're not lacking energy or enthusiasm when you're watching this video. If not, say, I'm excited, or you can sound really natural and say, I'm fired up, which means I'm excited, the opposite of weary. So put that in the comments now. I'm excited, I'm fired up. Don't confuse this with wary. Notice that pronunciation, air, wear, wary. Repeat that wary. This means not completely trusting or certain about something or someone. She was wary of strangers offering help after her previous bad experiences. Investors are becoming wary of the potential risks in the market. Let's review them side by side. Remember, weary, repeat after me, weary, tired or exhausted, wary, repeat after me, wary, cautious or careful. Don't worry about taking notes because I summarize everything in a free lesson PDF. You can find the link in the description. Now, how about this one? The dress was made for her wedding. The dress was made specially for her wedding, specially. First, let's review especially. Notice that uh, especially, uh, especially. For pronunciation, it's a very soft difference and you might not hear it at a natural pace. And I know some students, they add an uh at the front of S's. So when you try to say Especially, make sure you don't add that uh and make it sound like especially. So repeat after me, especially. This is used to single out one person or one thing over all others. So it's to emphasize the importance of something. She loves all styles of dance. Now, I want to emphasize one. Even though I'm talking about the category of dance, I want to emphasize one, so I can say especially ballet, especially ballet. The cake was delicious. Now that's a general statement. I want to highlight, to point out, to emphasize one thing about the cake that was delicious. The cake was delicious, especially the chocolate frosting. Now let's compare that to Especially. Notice that s, repeat that s, specially. This means for a particular purpose in a special manner. Although native speakers will benefit from this lesson because remember I told you that even native speakers confuse these words. So although native speakers will benefit from this lesson, it was made specially for non-native speakers, especially for you. Or I could say, I made this cake specially for you because maybe it's your birthday. Remember, especially, repeat, especially. Use to highlight something as being more important or relevant than others. Specially, repeat, specially. Use to indicate something done for a specific purpose or in a special manner. How about this one? The car remained during the traffic jam. The car remained stationary during the traffic jam. Stationary, notice that pronunciation, stationary. This means not moving or still. Right now, I am stationary. I'm not moving, I'm still. We often use this with objects. The bike remained stationary on its stand. Let's compare this to stationary. Exact same pronunciation. Notice there is just a spelling difference. Stationary, same pronunciation. But this is writing materials such as paper and envelopes. She bought new stationery for her office or the store sells beautiful stationery and cards. So remember, stationery, this means not moving or still. 
Stationary, with the exact same pronunciation but slightly different spelling, is writing materials like paper and envelopes. How about this one? She is a woman of strong... She is a woman of strong principles. This is another one where the pronunciation is the same, it's just a spelling difference. Principles, this is a basic truth and also used for moral rules for behavior. For example, honesty is an important principle in our family. Or he stood by his principles even when it was difficult. Now I'm sure you know who the principal is in a school. So the principal or a principal is the head of a school, but this can also mean main or most important. For example, the school principal delivered the speech. The principal reason, so in this case it means the main reason, the principal reason for the delay was the weather. So remember, principal, this is a basic truth or moral rule. And principal, the same pronunciation, this is the head of a school or the most important. So remember that spelling difference. How about this one? The news had a big on him. The news had a big effect, effect on him. Affect with an A, this is a verb. It means to have an influence on or make a difference to. For example, the cold weather can negatively affect your health. Notice how we added negatively because something can positively affect you or something else as well. In this one, his words deeply affected her feelings in this case, we actually don't know if it's positive or negative. We would need more information. Now, effect. Notice here when I say the individual word effect, I stress that E more, but in a natural sentence, I would just say effect. I wouldn't stress it as much. So it will sound very similar to affect the verb. It's the sentence structure that will tell you which one is needed because affect is a verb and effect is a noun. And as a noun, it means the result of a particular influence. For example, the medicine had an immediate effect. So here I know it's a noun on the patient's symptoms or the new policy had a positive effect because again, effects can be positive or negative just like the verb. So the policy had a positive effect on the company's productivity. So remember, effect, repeat after me, effect, effect. This means to influence or make a change and effect, said without stress, more in the natural way, effect, repeat after me, effect. This is the result of an outcome or a change. How about this one? I will your invitation. You probably knew it was I will accept your invitation. In this case, it's the pronunciation that is very similar and that might cause the confusion if you're using these. So accept, accept, repeat after me, accept. This means to receive willingly or to agree to. She accepted the job offer without hesitation. Or he accepted the gift graciously. Accept, repeat after me, accept. So we have accept, accept. Don't worry if you can't hear that difference because it is context that will tell you which one you need. But keep practicing and try to get that pronunciation difference. Except this is not including or other than. Everyone except John, so not including John. Everyone except John was present at the meeting. Or I like all vegetables except, how would you complete that? I like all vegetables except, 
put a vegetable you don't like that's not included, put your choice in the comments. For me, I like all vegetables except baby corn. I will not eat baby corn. So remember, accept means to receive or agree to something, and accept means excluding other than. How about this one? Your outfit really, your eyes. Your outfit really complements your eyes. And notice that spelling, the ending needs to have the E, not the I. Complements your eyes. So first let's look at the spelling with the I. This is a noun, a compliment. This means an expression of praise or admiration. She gave him a compliment. You give someone a compliment. She gave him a compliment on his new haircut. Or he received many compliments on his presentation. Now, compliment, the same pronunciation, but different spelling. Notice the ending has that E. Compliment is a verb. It's something that completes or goes well with something else. For example, ice cream perfectly complements apple pie, or her skills complement his experience. So he has a specific set of experience and her skills match perfectly with that. Her skills complement his experience. So remember, the pronunciation is the same, but complement as a noun, this is praise or admiration, and to complement as a verb, spelled with the E at the end, is to complete or enhance something. How about this one? The arrival of the guest was announced. The arrival of the eminent guest was announced. Eminent with an E, notice that pronunciation, em, eminent. Repeat after me, eminent. Good. Eminent means famous and respected within a particular sphere. The eminent professor was invited to speak at the conference. She met several eminent scientists at the event. So in the sphere, in the world of science, these particular people are eminent. But in other worlds, the world of music or dance, they're probably not eminent. Imminent with an I, notice this pronunciation, im, imminent. Repeat after me, imminent. Imminent means about to happen impending. The storm's arrival is imminent or the company face imminent bankruptcy. Remember, eminent, repeat, eminent. This means famous and respected. Imminent, repeat, imminent. This means about to happen. How about this one? Robert, that he was not interested in the position. Robert implied that he was not interested in the position. Imply, repeat after me, imply, imply. This means to suggest or indicate without explicitly stating. So he didn't say, I'm not interested, but maybe it was his body language or his tone or his reaction. For example, his tone implied that he was annoyed. So in this example, he did not say, I'm annoyed, but he said, well, can we do it already? And that implied that he was annoyed. You can use this in a positive way. Her smile implied that she was pleased with the outcome. Infer, repeat after me, infer, infer. This means to deduce or conclude information from evidence and reasoning. For example, from his words, I inferred that he was unhappy. So I concluded based on 
his words, maybe the tone of his voice or what he said, but he didn't specifically say, I'm unhappy. I inferred it because he implied it with his words. We use this a lot with making conclusions. She inferred from the data that the project was successful. Remember, imply, repeat after me, imply. This means to suggest or indicate. Infer, repeat after me, infer. This means to deduce or conclude from evidence. How about this one? The knot was to and came undone. The knot was too loose with two O's, loose and came undone. Loose means not tight or firmly fixed. We use this a lot with clothing. She wore a loose dress on a hot day. But you can use this to mean not tightly fixed. For example, the screws on the chair were loose. Now don't confuse this with the spelling of lose, which has one O and a different pronunciation because notice that z, z, lose, lose. Repeat after me, lose. But not tight, loose with an S, loose. Repeat after me, loose, lose. Okay, very good, practice that. To lose is of course to be unable to find something, but it also means to fail to win. For example, I always lose my keys or the team doesn't want to lose another game. So remember, loose, oose. This means not tight or firmly fixed and lose, z, lose. This means unable to find or fail. Do you want me to make more lessons just like this? If you do, put masterclass, masterclass, put masterclass in the comments. And of course, make sure you like this lesson, share it with your friends and subscribe so you're notified every time I post a new lesson. And you can get this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can click here to download it or look for the link in the description. And I have another masterclass you'll love, so make sure you watch it right now.